been Xperior uh, Laboratories' uh, fourth year attending the uh, uh, the CubeSat workshop. We're actually not. We're actually only within two hours of um, San Luis Obispo or Cal Poly, where this event is usually uh, hosted, and uh, actually have done work for several professors out of Cal Poly and uh, and around that area that are developing CubeSat and 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 other products and and so we wanted to continue the tradition of uh, supporting the event and uh, so I want to just go through here real quick and, and give you a little uh, introduction to uh, what we do at Xperior Laboratories. Um, Xperior Laboratories is a uh, environmental test laboratory so we provide uh, test services that range from mechanical to climatic to material type services and they are not necessarily spe uh, specialized in in space or for space products but basically we are product agnostic you know as long as we have the equipment and the capability uh, and the expertise to to execute a, a test uh, that is specified and, and, and described in, in a document, in a standards document, or in a customer provided statement of work, we can execute it. Uh, now, being here in Southern California and surrounded by a lot of space activities, um, space has certainly uh, become one of our uh, biggest business sectors, if you want, uh, with where we involve with many companies from the from the tier one so that the launch providers the, the big guys the big companies all the way down to the, the small component supplier who supplies something that will go into into a big uh, you know in, into a final system um just make sure my screen works here yes it does so anyway we uh, we're a small company um we're currently occupying five buildings of, of which you see four here that arranged in a little cluster very convenient uh so we're occupying about 60 60 000, uh square feet um in in oxnard which is near los angeles about an hour north of los angeles hour south of santa barbara uh right on the water um some of our accreditations uh some of them mean something to you some of them don't um iso 17025 is probably the most uh I guess important one uh, from a company point of view. It just speaks for our uh, quality system, the way we handle data to make sure we can stand behind the test data we we accumulate, and then also issue in reports and uh, just kind of an overall process accreditation. Um, and then further down, obviously for the space industry, it's our it's our NASA and and, and JPL approval where we were an approved supplier to NASA for test services and, and their programs and we're, we're, an, we're a, an approved test services supplier to JPL obviously NASA related JPL is within an hour uh, of our location and they have a lot of they have all the test capabilities um, but not all the capacity all the time so we, we do a lot of the overflow work things they can handle on time we we get to do for them um back to you know nasa we, we started well we started supporting space suppliers um probably 12 years 11 12 years ago um once we acquired some pieces of equipment that are important to that industry but about seven seven eight years ago we got involved with uh lockheed martin who's responsible for the uh, orion upper stage of the uh, um of the uh, NASA Deep Space Program. So we uh, we started supporting Lockheed, uh, qualifying uh, all of the electrical uh, connectors and wire harness systems on the Orion capsule, and then also started working with Boeing on the space launch systems, um, providing test services for many different components and subsystems that are uh being uh or will go on to onto the rocket so working and still very active in this program obviously this is big rocket big stuff um but again there's always small sat and cube sets riding along not necessarily on sls but on other rockets um so some of the test capabilities i'm just going to walk through some uh we obviously have many uh, a lot of them are relevant to other industries but uh, some of the, the key capabilities that are important for 
uh, CubeSat products, small set products, or you know any type of product. Generally speaking, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about vibration. Uh, I'll be talking about shock. I'll be talking about thermal vacuum, which is obviously important to make sure a uh, system, a test article actually performs once it's out in in orbit and in, in a vacuum and seeing extreme cold, extreme hot temperatures. Um, and uh, yeah, those those will be the kind of the, the key capabilities that we see a lot of times during during qualification or initial qualification and development. Uh, and then we'll see a few more disciplines once a product goes into into ATP or, or acceptance testing. Um, so on the vibration side, we uh, have quite some capacity. And so that's why companies uh, well, like JPL and NASA suppliers uh, like Boeing and others come to us. We currently operate uh, about 11 different vibration systems uh, of many different sizes uh, in our company, uh, all within the four buildings I've shown you earlier. Um, and they can handle any a variety of components. They can ha handle a very small, tiny, you know, sensor that is, you know, the size of your fingertip, uh, all the way to a full-on satellite of, of several thousand pounds, or or a rocket engine, or, or some other structure, lunar landers, or you know, you name it. Um, so that's kind of I guess one of our advantage and one of our strength, and and why people come look for us because of capacity as well as capability. Some of these shakers are can create launch like profiles of of a rocket taken off of, of uh, two stages separating uh, up uh, in space, et cetera. So very high G level vibration. But then a lot of times the, the, the workhorse, the bed and brother brother work is, you know, low profile 14 G 14.3 GRMS type of profiles for payload that simply uh, writes along um, in one of our buildings, uh, we do have a high bay. Uh, we have uh, four different shakers in there now, of which the upper two in the upper right-hand corner there, two are our two biggest ones. Um, they're 40,000 pound four shakers. They can lift, you know, more than the CubeSat. They can lift about 5,000 pounds each. Um, so obviously we would we use those for full size test article systems. We had rocket engines up there. We currently have an orbital reflector up there installed and, and, and testing, um, which is flight hardware. A lot of times that the hardware we see, especially finished product is flight hardware that, that's coming in and then being launched and being delivered to our customers end customer and then will go into orbit. Uh, and so with that uh, also comes our clean room. Um, provisioning where this entire building here, which has a 33 foot ceiling, uh, it's 11,000 square foot big. Uh, it's a class 100,000 clean room. So the entire building uh, is uh, a clean room, which again, makes it nice for, or suitable for sensitive hardware um, that will be seeing orbit. Some things, and again, this is again, not necessarily, you know, CubeSat, but it's in general just qualification testing what we can do with these big systems. We can do it with the smaller systems too. Um, we've over the years developed some capabilities uh, on how we can tandem uh, two shakers together. Uh, we call that a, a, a dual shaker capability tandem um, and have them work together uh, combined or, or joint basically at the hip with, with a big plate that is suspended across um, and you see that in the in the very simple plate in the bottom right hand corner. You see a very sophisticated uh, fixture in the upper left hand corner. That, that fixture, uh, for example, is currently on our shakers install as you see it, and it's it's eight by oh, it's 20 feet long by eight feet wide and about a foot thick. So it's about 2,500 pounds by itself. Uh, and then the test article that's currently installed on there. That or orbital reflector is adds another, I believe, 20, 2,500 pounds to the setup. So these shakers can lift quite, quite a bigger weight. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a super heavy 
test article, but it could also be a, a long test article. So if you, for example, take a, uh, a separation actuator that, that helps push two stages of a rocket apart as it, as it disconnects, um, we've tested one of those and fully, uh, fully suspended or uh, extended uh, better. Um, the one that we tested was 17 foot long. So 17 foot long test article that was suspended across two, two shakers. As you see in the lower left hand corner, that's a smaller, that's only a uh, 10 foot, uh, eight foot device there. Um, but again, we can suspend things across two shakers, feed them the same signal, and have the two shakers basically work together, lifting a, a test article together. Um, another uh, parameter that we're that we're very strong in, uh, have a lot of expertise in, um, developed some expertise because of our involvement with Lockheed Martin and Orion or NASA and Orion. Some of the levels that we've seen there is SRS shock. Um, so in the past for like military applications that the shock requirements, military components have that go onto airplanes and tanks and ships, et cetera, is usually half sign um, shock pulses that have a certain pulse width and a certain G level. Uh, so it's a half sign or a sawtooth type of pulse shape. Um, for space rocket components, uh, we're mainly talking about SRS. Um, shock profiles, as you see there in, in the lower right hand corner, and we can execute shock testing uh, on our shakers. Uh, we can have we have drop shock systems. We have resonant beam systems The for the lower levels, um, maybe up to below 5000 G's, um, certain components depending on payload. And of course, depending on the size of the payload, we can perform shock testing on our vibration system. So we can actually program our vibration controllers to execute a shock test. So not just a vibration test, but a shock test. Nice thing about doing shock testing on a vibration system uh, is that you can also put a thermal chamber on top of it. Uh, so then you can, you can basically uh, expose your component to two environments at the same time. You can shock it or shake it um, while being at minus 200 or plus 200 or, or any type of temperature, so to speak, um, while being exposed to uh, a dynamic environment. Um, now, if if the test article grows in size or the G levels go up, um, or the G levels go up, as for example, we had to uh, um, achieve for Lockheed Martin's Orion program, where um, a lot of the profiles we had to meet were stage separation profiles and, and, the, and the profile that we originally had to aim for was 29,500 G's. So almost 30,000 G's of shock um, for you know electrical components. So it's not little compared to 300 G uh, 11 millisecond for a connector uh, or, or a component that goes on to a fighter airplane. So quite, quite a bit higher. So for, for levels like that and, and bigger size article, we use a resonant beam system. Let's just see if my, my video works here. So you see in the lower right hand corner there, basically what we do is we'll shoot an air, uh, uh, an air compressed projectile up underneath the beam, basically a big old slug or a bullet that we uh, shoot up against the underneath of uh, a metal beam or table. Um, and we um, input the shock wave into the fixture that sits above and the, and, and the component of the test article that's attached to it uh, will expose it this way. And again, with a system like that, we've been able to, uh, well, if it's a small component, we can reach levels close to 40, 45,000 Gs. But then of course, the, the larger the payload, the lower the G levels, because obviously mass will, will damper the G levels that you, you can hit. Um, so there are options. Um, another uh, component, not not uh, mechanical, but more more environmental, is vacuum testing. Obviously, uh, you want to make sure that your 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 system, your component, whatever whatever you make, um, is going to operate once it's out there in orbit, since we can't get it back to repair. Um, so we have thermal vacuum chambers at our at our company. 
thermal vacuum chambers that um, can give us the, the vacuum environment. So all the way down to 10 to minus seven, super clean components, 10 to minus eight, we've even been able to go down to 10 to minus nine, but they're rated somewhere around 10 to the minus seven tor um, and have a temperature range of around minus to plus 200 degrees C. So in the, in the lower left-hand picture there, you see uh, a thermal platen that's installed in the chamber. Um, this platen has uh, an LN2 line uh, that's fed through it for cooling and has electrical heaters installed for heating. And so with it, we can reach that temperature range. Uh, sometimes we also use uh, shrouds if we not only want to uh, provide the, the, the temperature through the platen into the fixture, into the test article, but we want to expose the test article to uh, uh, temperature environment all around, we, we can add a shroud to, uh, to the system. We can add uh, copper straps, anything mechanic, anything that gives us mechanical contact with, with the device, since in the absence of air, all, all, the, all the heat or the heat and cooling transfer is, is done through um, conduction and, and not convection. Since we don't have air, there's no transfer of temperature through air. Since that's that's not in there anymore. Um, another thing these these chambers uh, do do offer is, and you see that in the in the lower right hand picture, they have several feed through ports. Since uh, a lot of these components are operated, actuated, uh, measured while we're being exposed to those environments, and so we can build all types of different custom feed through ports, and they can range from just simple uh, feed through ports for for uh, thermocouples, uh, electrical wires to, to power something, um, to measure something. Um, we, we've also built windows uh, into these feed-through ports, uh, built a window for a customer who needed an infrared kind of access to, actu uh, to actuate his device or his system inside the chamber. We've had uh, mechanical feed-throughs for actuators that portion of the actuators outside the chamber, portion of the actuators inside the chamber. Um, and then, of course, gas and fluid. So we've had uh, actually four small set. We had a uh, small th a set thruster um, in our chamber and we fired it um, while being in a thermal vacuum environment. So that's obviously its its job. Uh, once it goes out there and we, the customer wanted to measure the thrust that the, um, the thruster was putting out. While being while being in the system, so there are many different options, many different things that one can do. Um, if one just wants to um, temperature cycle um, to make sure that, for example, a material doesn't get brittle, seeing lots of uh, temperature temperature shocks where you go from very hot to very cold, very hot to very cold, kind of sun off, sun on. Um, Type of, type of cycles, we can just use thermal chambers of which we have many, many different sizes, performances, shapes, you name it. Because um, a lot of times what we do with, you know, take take a solar panel uh, or, or, or any system that, that's out there in orbit during its lifetime, it could potentially see um, 90,000 sun off, sun off on cycles. So that's hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold types of cycles so and that needs to be replicated and we we do have customers well, again for example off solar panels and also uh, structure material um, booms etc that want to see their material their system being cycled that many times now if one took a uh, a standard environmental temperature chamber for that where where the temp ramp rate is somewhere around three to five six maybe 10 degrees per minute, 90,000 cycles could take forever um, or too long. So what we use for that is we conditioned or internally built some of these accelerated life uh, test chambers that have a much, much faster heat and cooling transfer and we can create or we can achieve uh, temp ramp rates um, between 30 and 40 degrees per minute. So you can 
much faster cycle between let's just say plus 200 minus 200 plus 200 minus 200 and you can get thousands of cycle in in somewhat a reasonable reasonable time and these chambers these chambers are busy and again product will be out there for a certain period of time and, and it's going to survive and and sometimes there are post tests mechanical post tests that 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 we are doing and have the capability for um again if we do this for material purposes we can do a tension uh, tensile elongation test we can do a bend test we can apply some pressure uh, we can do inspections we can do x-rays to see if a product you know, gets brittle cracks fractures etc um, and then sometimes they go back into the chamber for a num other number of thousands of cycles and come back out for another set of mechanical tests just to make sure they, they will survive and last while, while they're out there being deployed. Um, also, obviously, uh, cryo, you know, temperature, we do a lot. LN2 uh, is used as probably one of our biggest expenses beside electricity at our, at our facility just because of um, Tests we use LN2 for. We're not, we're not only using it to um, pressurize components and, and, and systems, but we also use it to boost thermal chambers to adding to get them to much colder than than they can uh, provide themselves. A, a normal temperature chamber is is maybe specified at minus 70, minus 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, with LN, we need LN2 in order to get down to to cryo temperatures. So we have. Um, an LN2 tank installed on the outside of our building, and many of our systems are directly plumbed into that system, so we never run out of LN2, and these tests can run independently on their own overnight, all around the clock. Um, and, uh, you know, otherwise you'll be, you know, exchanging doers in the middle of the night because you're running out. Uh, um, for helium, we don't have a helium tank in house that will gas off way too fast, so for helium, um, tests we will just bring helium doers in house um, but we just recently qualified some space wires and we needed to expose them to liquid helium and then perform some mecha uh, mechanical uh, as well as electrical tests on those components after they were sitting in a in a liquid helium bath so we have this capability um, as well we already talked about this um, we have entire facility uh, our vibration facility that that's a clean room uh, class 100,000. We can also turn any of our workstations into a clean room. We, we have portable clean rooms as you see in the upper some in some of the pictures here you see basically easy up tents um, that have you know HEPA filters and installed and we can get class 100,000 clean rooms basically anywhere in our building uh, if somebody wants it on top of a thermal chamber or just the workspace or there in uh, on top of one of our other shakers in one of our other buildings um, we can create that class 100,000 clean room environment everywhere um, we also have laminar flow benches that we can uh, make available to our customers for inspection of components uh, in between tests or assembly of components uh, disassemble of, of of components again makes it convenient customer doesn't have take the components back home to disassemble and inspect it can be in keep it on right at, at our facility um then a couple of other disciplines uh, that uh we see regularly but we don't have internal uh capability for we partnered with with a couple of experts uh, expert companies uh in the industry so one of them is we provide electrodynamic vibration random vibration um testing for structures. Uh, another aspect of vibration testing is acoustics, uh, where you actually uh, send sound waves at components to make sure that they stay mechanically sound. And so for that, we partnered with a company called Maryland Sound uh, Incorporated. They're based on the East Coast. And what they provide is they provide mobile DFAT testing or direct, uh, direct field acoustic testing. Um, MSI does a lot of work down at the Cape, Florida, in, in the upper right hand corner, you see their system being set up around the Orion capsule. Um, so they come on site, set up their speakers and in the lower section of the pictures, you see their system being set up 
or, or yeah, being set up at, at our uh, at our company. So we've had a number of uh, successful campaigns, and and again, uh, partnering with experts, where we are the um, vibration shock uh, thermal vacuum experts, so we have expertise. Uh, MSI brings the uh, the acoustic portion to to the table, and then one other thing that obviously or another discipline that comes in um, uh, regularly and obviously is important, especially for electronic systems and, and and components in general, is EMI and EMC. And here we partner with another company here in Southern California, the DNB Engineering, that are, who are the experts in EMI, EMC high RF lightning and ESD testing. And Xperia, in return, we support DNB with our uh, capabilities that I that I just showed you showed you here. So it's a good partnership and it helps our customers because they don't have to piece out the, the various different tests to different companies. They can basically contract with us and we will pull in partners and experts uh, in order to accomplish and perform the, um, the entire program. And I think with that, getting to the end, that's it. Um, see my email there, see my number there. If, if you would like uh, a copy of this presentation, I'd be happy to email it to you. Just uh, send me an email and, and I'll get you a PDF copy of it.